Institute of Australia and we're about to make a start on our uh, first of the Peer Congress Highlights for 2013 uh, online seminars. Um, throughout the month of June, uh, Peer is going to be hosting a number of uh, short lunchtime webinars uh, to showcase some of the, the really great presentations that we had at the Peer National Congress um, earlier this year in Canberra. Um, it's a great chance uh, for you to catch some of the presentations that you might have missed, um, but also uh, as a refresher for inspiration for those of you that were able to attend um, our session in, uh, in Canberra. Uh, P is really excited to be um, being able to bring these sessions to you online, um, and we're going to continue to explore and expand our online program uh, to meet the needs of our members um, to fit in with your uh, geographically dispersed nature. You know, we've got members all over the country as well as overseas, um, but also your uh, busy professional lives. We know that sometimes it can be difficult for you to get time uh, to get out of the office to attend seminars in person. And so bringing uh, these webinars uh, to you online is another way of peer delivering uh, service to you uh, this time while you're sitting at your desk. Uh, our first webinar is going to be hosting uh, Peer's National President, uh, Di Curry, and the American Planning Association um, immediate past president, Mitchell Silver. Um, and they're going to be presenting their inspirational talks on making a difference. Uh, these two presentations were in the first session of, uh, of Congress in Canberra and were great motivators for why our profession is so important. Um, the structure for the session today will be that uh, I'll introduce Di and Di will give her presentation. I'll then introduce Mitch and he'll give his presentation and then we'll have a session at the end uh, for an opportunity for you um, to uh, provide uh, questions to uh, both uh, Mitch and I. Um, with the question time, if you can type your questions into the chat box, uh, you should be able to see on the right of your screen um, and uh, when you're selecting the audience, uh, put it to uh, the uh, either the panellists overall or to myself, so that was uh, Kirsty Kelly, uh, and I will repeat the questions back to both Mitch and I at the end of the session um, to keep the session flowing smoothly. And so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Diane Curry. Uh, Di is the National President of the Planning Institute of Australia, a position that she's held since March 2011. Uh, Di is a qualified and experienced strategic development assessment planner, having qualifications in urban and physical geography urban and regional planning, public sector management. Uh, she's currently manager of strategic planning at Toowoomba Regional Council in Queensland. Uh, additionally, Di has been a long-term member of the development industry organisations, including PIA and the UDIA, and she served three years as the chair of the South East Queensland Development Assessment Managers Group. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Di. Thanks, Kirsty. And greetings, everybody. Hello uh, from a beautiful winter's day in Toowoomba, uh, where it's bright blue sky outside of my office uh, and was a lovely frost this morning. So I, I hope you're all having a lovely day around the country and overseas for our international members that are joining us. Today, as Kirsty said, I would like to share with you uh, a a speech for me uh, that is about the value of our profession uh, from this year's National Congress, uh, a, a discussion on how planning matters. So today we're here to celebrate the value of planning. Ours is a profession that seeks to create great outcomes within the built and natural environments. We look to ensure intergenerational equity, to improve the well-being of our people and communities, to protect our environment, our farmland and our water supply. We want to create great places to have fun and to enjoy life and to facilitate jobs and economic development. And all of that happens before our first cup of tea every day. What a job it is we have, but also what an amazing opportunity. This isn't a profession, of course, for the faint-hearted. We're often in the middle of competing interests, complex challenges and the occasional long night. But wow, when it all comes together, magic happens and it's all worthwhile. This morning I'd like to share with you some thoughts. Hello, we've just lost our screens. Here we go. I'd like to share with you some thoughts on the difference that planners make in the world, to consider the challenges facing us, and then to share with you an exciting strategy from the Planning Institute of Australia to support our members. 
I was privileged to spend some time recently in the UNESCO World Heritage listed town of Pienza in Italy. Pienza was the first example of formal planning that would become so important in the world from then on. The application of the principle of the planned town in Pienza, and in particular the group of buildings around the central square, resulted in what UNESCO described as a masterpiece of human creative genius. That for me is the joy of planning, bringing together other professions to create great places and spaces. That's the legacy that I hope to leave in my own way. Now I know that Pienza was all a long time ago and that a lot has happened since then, but I have no doubt that our profession continues to make a positive contribution to the world. A masterpiece of human creative genius is not a bad goal for my daily work. I believe in what I do and I believe in the value that we bring as a profession. Today I would like to ask you what it is that you love about your profession. What will your legacy be? Will you be someone who works with their community to articulate their vision for the future? Will you be someone who focuses on the achievement of a great outcome for every development application that you assess? Will you be someone who helps shift an entire town to prevent another natural disaster resulting in tragedy? Or will you help improve your state's entire planning system to focus on great culture and outcomes for all? Good planning often goes unnoticed to an untrained eye. We all have places we love to visit and we understand how planning help bring together those outcomes. Every year, the Planning Institute of Australia celebrates outstanding planning outcomes in our Awards for Excellence process, where we see great places, excellent community engagement processes, and where we thank those in and out of our profession who champion the role of planning in our society. At Congress this year, His Royal Highness Prince Charles shared with us the value of planning from his perspective. But what about the difference in the world that we would see without planning? Now I don't want to offend by showing places without planning or with questionable planning, but we all know them. Those places where you can't get around, where housing is unaffordable, parks don't exist, and people feel unsafe. And maybe there are some processes around that could do with some improvement. Are there times when we've become too comfortable in regulating against a possibility rather than helping achieve a good outcome? I've spent a lot of time in the last few years asking questions about the planning process across Australia. And there have been times when I'd have to say the answers have scared me. I've met planners that haven't known the value that they add with every application they process. And they haven't at times been able to look at the potential outcome, instead have been focused on the rules. Are we focusing our development assessment energies in the right way is a key point I'd like to return to later. I know that planning matters and that planners make a difference. I also believe that the continuous improvement in how we undertake our job is vital. My challenge to us all is how we share that knowledge with others. So I'd like to take a step back for a moment and look at some of the critical challenges that we have been dealing with. We all know it's been a challenging few years. Australia has faced significant, complex, global, regional and local demands that have impacted on our society, the environment and the economy. These diverse challenges have included population growth, demographic change, infrastructure provision, transport and access, food scarcity, biodiversity loss, disaster resilience and many more. And then there was the little thing called the global financial crisis. The Planning Institute of Australia and the planning profession have a key role to play in supporting and facilitating solutions to these issues. Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties. I'll just move down. At least you know it's live, people. A key challenge that we have faced in recent years has been the ongoing natural disasters. As we know, it has been a very trying time for many in Australia. Mother Nature has tested us again and again and again. Australia in recent years has seen major disasters, floods and bushfires. We've seen the emergence of a strong need for resilience in planning and in people as trying times have continued. Who would ever have thought that Queensland would be experiencing major disastrous floods again within two years of the dreadful 2011 summer? 
that we would be again battling floods at one end of the country and bushfires at the other end at the same time. So let's just have a look back over those last couple of years. 2009, as you will all know, we saw the Black Saturday bushfires in Victoria. 1.1 million acres were burnt through 400 individual fires and in excess of 170 lives were lost. A key point to note out of those fires was the establishment of the Victorian Bushfire Authority, which included land use planners in their team. Significant flooding in Queensland in the summer of 2010-2011 resulted in every local government area in Queensland being disaster activated. The floods were unprecedented in their scale and scope of impact and the reconstruction that would be needed. 2011 also saw, sorry, I'm again having difficulties. Sorry, I'm just trying to bring the presentation back, which it doesn't appear to want to do. And I'll come back in a second. And that's a good technical crash, Kirsty. We've just lost my entire system. Kirsty? You can see, hello, you can see my presentation. Well, my entire system has just crashed. What can you see? Don't laugh, Wilson. Hi everyone, we're just having some technical difficulties with uh, Di's uh, presentation. Her uh, computer has decided to re reboot. Um, not the best time for it to reboot. Um, we'll just bear with it for a couple, another minute. Um, if it doesn't come back straight away, we might uh, switch over to, to Mitch. Uh, Di, how's the reboot going? Is it it's almost? logging back in now. Okay. Just. Uh, Bear with us for a moment, everyone. Uh, the, the joys of live uh, live technology. Just picture you're sitting at a seminar and uh, and uh, the presentation freezes on screen. So normally you'd be able to uh, chat to the people sitting sitting next to you. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that uh, that uh, chance here. Although I do believe we have a number of uh, people that are joining us at the seminar today uh, that are sitting in groups uh, together around the country. So it's great to. Uh, Great to have you uh, able to uh, get together in a group to watch uh, watch these presentations, um, and it sounds like it won't be won't be much longer um, for it uh, all to come back up on up online. Um, it didn't like the frost this morning in Toowoomba, apparently. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's the start of winter. I think that's the that's the sign. It'll uh, it'll do that to us.
Opening now, Kirsty. Excellent, great. Thanks, everyone. So, thanks for your patience, everyone. It uh, sounds like it's almost, <laughs> almost there. The joys of technology. Yes, let's see. Chat, chat amongst yourselves for a moment. Excellent. Here we go. Let's see if this works. Can you see that, Kirsty? I can still see the same slide before, which was the aeroplane strip. Have you logged back into the teleconference, uh, to the webinar? No, I haven't realised I'd need to, but of course I do. Yep. Just a few more moments, everyone. Now, I haven't seen uh, so far any questions coming through the, uh, the chat box, so do uh, uh, make, make use of the... Uh, the chat box, even if it's just to send a test message, so we know that uh, we can see that you're there, um, so we can compile the questions ready for uh, Di's presentation um, when uh, uh, she gets back up online shortly. And then, of course, Mitch, uh, who will follow follow Di, and, and Mitch is joining us from uh, from the US in a very different time zone to uh, to the rest of us. Um, so it's the uh, the wonders of uh, the wonders of technology. Sometimes uh, doesn't doesn't always work for us, but uh, uh, when it is working, it can be a marvellous thing. And we'll have Di back shortly. She's just uh, logging back in. Yes, you've got, got to love when your computer decides to do automatic updates when you're in the middle of something important. I think we've all had that happen to us in the past. A few more moments. I can see dice almost back. Um, okay, has that got me back? Yep, we've got you there on the line. Uh, so we'll get. Yep, Gillian, switching things over to you now. We'll have your presentation up um, across to you in a minute. So, Di, have you got your PowerPoint open to the spot? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready to go. Yep, great. I'm right. Uh, yep. Julian should be able to flick it over to you now, I think. We're right to go. Leave so you're there as the presenter. Excellent. How about that? Are we back? Yes. Kirsty's gone, which means I'm back. My apologies to everyone. Obviously, my computer decided to die, and I lost everything. So, let's go back to the summer of 2011 in Queensland. So, as I was saying, uh, 2011 saw unprecedented flooding as you know, across Queensland. We saw 4.5 times the area of France and Germany combined underwater. And that flooding wasn't just in Queensland. Between September 2010 and February 2011, many Victorian towns and communities were subject to successive floods, causing repeated damage across the country. The 2011 summer also, as many of you know, resulted in 35 deaths in Queensland, with in particular the township of Grantham being destroyed in images that were shared around the world. For those of you that know the local geography, because the Grantham area is an area that I've worked in over the years and is about 20 minutes away from Toowoomba. And then if 
the summer hadn't been enough that year. On the 3rd of February, severe tropical cyclone Yasi, a Category 5 cyclone, made landfall. There were devastating impacts along the coastline from wind force and storm surge. And then just after Yasi crossed in Western Australia, we were experiencing severe bushfires with over 100 homes being either destroyed or heavily damaged. It is significant to note that after both the Queensland and Victorian flood events, formal review processes were established in both states which put land use planning directly in the spotlight. Then again, in 2012, Queensland and northern New South Wales saw extensive flooding, including some of the highest ever recorded flood levels. 2013, we saw bushfires. Yet again this year, we've seen the extremes of our country with bushfires in Tasmania. And repeated flooding and tornadoes, uh, sorry, repeated flooding and tornadoes in Queensland, with tornadoes also occurring in New South Wales in March. Now we all know that climate change is real and our profession needs to adapt to this. Planning is now about resilience and adaptation. Helping our communities and political leaders deal with the challenges of a new reality and that planning is key to finding solutions is a future for us. Resilience will be a strong theme for us as planners from here forward. I suggest to you that the approach to Grantham in Queensland is an example of a new path. Do we automatically rebuild or do we relocate willing communities out of harm's way? Do we think about risk management in a different way in the future? Rising from the devastation in this town was a planning outcome driven by the community and delivered in a collaborative manner by all levels of government. This outcome saw the affected residents who wanted to shift relocated and in their new homes on higher ground by Christmas of 2011, all within 10 months of the tragic event. In Grantham's case, when the 2013 floods came through, residents were safe. This outcome was all about planners working with their community and with elected officials to achieve an outcome. That's the value add we bring. A key phrase in this community was local knowledge being expert knowledge in the creation of the new town. And as we all know, in addition to the natural disasters that we've been experiencing, there have been other challenges. The context of planning has changed in recent years. The focus until that point was on managing significant population growth. We then had a period of structural and microeconomic reform, the growth of the seamless economy, and then along came the GFC. The GFC, albeit at a different scale in Australia, has prompted governments at all levels to increase support to communities, to encourage growth, and to seek maximum value from their infrastructure spending. Planning didn't cause the GFC, but I'm really not sure at times that planners understand the fundamental economic power of what we do to help lift an economy. The game has changed for planning. Planning throughout the world has been blamed in recent years for slowing down economic development, for having too much red tape and for not achieving outcomes. This has led to pressure for reform around the country. The complex challenges facing our society in recent years have in many cases resulted in most of the states and territories in Australia undertaking planning reform exercises. We've also seen work from the Council of Australian Governments in this space in recent years. The focus of many of these reform processes has been on streamlining development assessment, on processing development applications faster and faster, and on cutting red tape. Oh, for heaven's sake. Good. Sorry, I was worried that my system was crashing again. <laughs> now, while I support the cutting of red tape, I also believe we need an appropriate level of regulation to implement the community vision. The right development in the right location at the right time is our goal. I would argue we need to shift our focus from being centred on development assessment to focusing our energy on strategic planning stages and then implementing that vision through the DA process. Shifting the bulk of community engagement to the strategic planning phase and to properly engaging our communities at that point, and I do mean proper engagement, not just consultation for the sake of ticking a box, and then streamlining the development assessment process as much as possible without sacrificing the quality of that decision making should be our goal. Now I know this is not an easy balance. 
However, while we all know that development assessment is important, it's only part of the planning system picture. It's one element of a much more complex framework. The Planning Institute of Australia supports ongoing improvements to the assessment process, but also advocates for a stronger focus on the strategic planning processes. We advocate for the development of a planning system that listens to its community, creates visions for cities and towns, and then creates a clear path to the achievement of that vision. A complicated process if a proposal does not align with the vision, and a straightforward process if it does. A more flexible system of governance and planning that encourages industries and producers to function effectively. A system that fosters employment, productivity, housing and social sustainability. A system that coordinates infrastructure delivery with strategic planning. So, change is ahead. We need to review and adapt to these changing circumstances and complex challenges. The Planning Institute of Australia believes we need to change our approaches to risk. Are we currently too risk averse? Worried about prevention in both how we write regulation and then how we implement it? Is the alternative to measure and then manage risk? A shift from risk aversion approaches in drafting planning schemes and in assessing applications to one of risk management? Do we really need to see that particular application type? Does it really need that assessment level? What value will we add to the outcome? Have we focused on the key aspects of the application rather than focusing on the micro detail that doesn't add value? I would hope that every person in this webinar knows that good planning is integral to livable and productive communities and that part of good planning is a focus on outcomes rather than process. This is all about the bigger picture, looking at the global context. We all know that the planning system is part of a much bigger picture. There are two components of that picture for me, the global context and the second component is the range of people we work with. As a profession, we work with groups in the development industry from different professions, the finance industry, with our communities, with special interest groups, and of course with our elected officials at multiple levels. Most key decisions are made by our political processes and therefore by our community. We need to work with our community and our elected leaders to clarify the importance of planning and the positive impact that planning has on our communities. We need to work with them on a new approach to enhance strategic planning and to review regulation to ensure that good outcomes are achieved. We've seen an increasing focus on this approach around Australia as particularly evident in the recent New South Wales White Paper. I want to be clear that I know that the great outcomes that we see in projects come from a collaboration of professionals, the community and elected officials in most cases. Our role is in bringing them together and finding an outcome. That's our contribution. We can be the glue to enable good outcomes. So when you add all of this up, the pressure is on us. The profession is experiencing competing forces such as disaster resilience, economic growth, reform agendas, funding pressures and housing affordability. But the Planning Institute of Australia has stepped in to help. It was my pleasure at Congress in March to launch a series of key actions that PIA will be undertaking in the next three years. We are a small but very important profession in the facilitation of solutions across our country and the Planning Institute of Australia will be assisting our profession and all of our members to deliver good planning outcomes in these challenging times. I was very pleased to announce in March the adoption of the Planning Matters Shaping the World Today for Tomorrow strategy on behalf of the Institute. The Planning Institute of Australia is committed to ensuring that its members use good planning to deliver great outcomes. The Planning Institute of Australia declares that good planning is the best way to manage urban growth, to secure necessary infrastructure investment, to determine appropriate settlement patterns for our cities and towns, to generate economic development that contributes positively to the well-being of individuals and communities and the natural and built environments on which we rely. Planning matters and planners make a difference. Planners help manage change at local, regional, state, national and international scales. They develop policy, they identify and deliver agreed community outcomes, 
often in really politically charged environments. PIA has a central role to play in promoting, advocating for and educating society about the value that planning brings. Planning makes a difference. Planners think through the public interest. We care about the future. We balance competing interests to find great outcomes. We can help our elected leaders make the tough decisions they need to make. Over the next three years, PIA will continue to help its members to become the best they can be. PIA commits to a program of work to ensure our members are trained and empowered to deliver good planning outcomes. We're going to inspire you to believe in our profession again. We will help you articulate the value of, that the planning profession brings and we're going to teach you the communication skills to do so if needed. We'll also work with related industries, the community and politicians at all levels in this regard. So, an overview of the strategy. Planning Institute of Australia will focus, invigorate and position members and the profession through a series of key actions including focusing our members to be bold planning professionals committed to delivering good planning, invigorate the profession by inspiring planners to embrace change and to understand the value we bring, and to position our profession by championing good planning. Through this strategy, we aim to reinforce the value of planning, to acknowledge the variety of planning roles, to transform perceptions, to confirm that planning is a positive tool to achieve real and lasting outcomes for how we live, work and play, and to emphasise that change, particularly cultural change, is a shared responsibility that also relies on all stakeholders working together, and that PIA is prepared to and is already taking on the coordination and leadership required. So, how are we going to do all of this? We will advocate for legislative and regulatory change as needed. We'll develop and implement cultural change programs across Australia with a focus on a risk management rather than risk aversion approach. To be perfectly clear, this is not about saying that people are not doing a good job. This is about continuous improvement and adapting to changing circumstances. We will document and promote the positive contribution of planning to improving places, productivity and health. We will equip members with a communications toolkit. This will help members engage more effectively with stakeholders, government and the community. We'll establish a planning peers group in each state and territory to advocate for the value of planning. And we will align all national and state or territory peer work programs, communications and events to drive a program of activities to focus, invigorate and position our profession. A key component of this strategy is about cultural change, a change of approach about how we do things. This change of approach is called cultural change by some, capacity building by others. For me, this is about shifting approaches and allowing planners and elected officials to really focus on the sections or the applications that matter. This requires a potential review of approach by both political and technical levels. This is about adjusting our focus in changing times. So, some more details. There were five key components released in March. Over the last few months, we've been consulting around the country on a good planning position statement. The role of strategic planning, the coordination of infrastructure planning with land use planning, as well as development assessment reforms are all crucial components of a good planning system. The importance of an engaged community at the start of the process rather than an adversarial consultation towards the end is important. Consultation has now closed and the comments received are with our policy committee to be considered. So while we engage with the state and federal governments regularly now, PIA will enter into more formal processes around the country to deliver the outcomes of this strategy. In New South Wales and Queensland, PIA have already been working directly with the state governments on joint projects to deliver these outcomes. Under the excellent leadership of New South Wales President Sarah Hill, PIA has been working with the New South Wales Government through the development of the Legislative Reform Issues Papers. PIA New South Wales have advocated for a new act, they've been quoted in the green and white papers and in particular in the sections on cultural change. They've been a key advisor in the green and white paper processes, they cheered with the announcement of a new position of Deputy Director of Culture Change in the State Department. They've been publicly recognised by other industry groups for their work in this area 
and have been recognised and thanked by the New South Wales Minister for Planning and Infrastructure. In Queensland, Pia has also been blessed with the outstanding leadership of President Kate Isles. Pia Queensland had a significant role in advising and informing recent amendments to legislation and the Regional and Resource Town Action Plan. Pia Queensland have been working with the State Government and the Local Government Association to develop a partnership agreement and a training program in capacity building and cultural change. It's wonderful to see both levels of government working with the industry to achieve this together. PIA will be approaching the other state governments and local government associations with related proposals in coming months. Thirdly, we'll be advocating to all sides during the coming federal election campaign about the value of planning and the improvements we think are needed. In order to help you explain the value of planning, we've also been working on some key messages. There are messages for the public, and they are, planning strengthens communities, facilitates economic development, and improves the choices available for where and how people live and work. That planning facilitates decision making and helps balance private, government, and community interests for future net benefit. And that planning helps to identify hazards and reduce risks it also identifies and protects environmental, social, cultural and heritage values. And then there are some messages for you as members. That we support your, you in delivering good planning outcomes. And that we collaborate with government, academia and the public and private sector to improve the delivery of planning services and community access to planning. And lastly, number five, Coming soon is a Planning Matters multimedia competition. This will be your opportunity to share with us why planning matters to you and to your community. Brooke Yates, our Young Planner National Director, and Mike McEwen, the Editor of Queensland Planner, are coordinating this competition. We're looking for your creativity and your skill to share the value of planning with the world through this competition. So Pia is committed to this process. What about you? What do we need you to do? We need you to be inspired, to love what you do. We change the world, we shape the future every single day and we need to remember that. So we need you to participate in training sessions and to advocate for good planning, to be able to explain the value of planning at all times, when you're in a public meeting, when you're at the counter, when you're working with clients, when you're working with politicians. So we're asking you to share your thoughts on the value of planning and how we can communicate this to our community. Email me, join in the discussions on LinkedIn, talk to your division presidents or staff. We're keen to hear from you. So as we meet here today across the country and around the world, I ask you to consider what your legacy will be. What difference will you make as a planner? You know that I believe that planning matters. I look forward to hearing from you on why it matters to you and sharing that passion with your community. Over to you, Kirsty. Thank you very much, Di. Uh, that was great. We got, got there in the end and hopefully uh, your, uh, your computer is uh, all up and, uh, up and running for the rest of the day. Um, so uh, thank you, Di. Um, our next speaker uh, today is uh, Mitchell Silver. Um, Mitch uh, is the Chief Planning and Economic Development Officer in the City of Raleigh, North Carolina, and that's where he joins us from, um, which is this evening in the, over there in the US. Um, Mitch is an award-winning planner with more than 25 years of planning experience. He's nationally recognised for his leadership in the profession and his contributions to contemporary planning issues. Uh, before coming to Raleigh in uh, 2005 as Planning Director, Mitch worked as a Policy and Planning Director in New York City, um, a principal of New York City-based planning firm, a town manager uh, in New Jersey and Deputy Planning Director in Washington, D.C. He taught graduate planning courses at Hunter College, Brooklyn College, Pratt Institute and North Carolina State University. As Planning Director in Raleigh, he led the Comprehensive Plan Update process. He's now overseeing a rewrite of the city's development code and there's some pretty exciting things going on in Raleigh. Uh, Mitch uh, is a great uh, tweeter and I often uh, have a look at the uh, things coming through from the work uh, that he's involved with over there. Um, Mitch is of course also the immediate past president of the American Planning Association and we had the, the pleasure of Mitch's company 
uh, in uh, Canberra in March. Um, and so we'd like I'd like to hand over to Mitch now uh, for him to present to us today. Thank you, Mitch. Okay. Okay, I want to first make sure that you can see the screen. Okay, well first uh, let me say good morning, even though it is evening here, uh, Monday night, uh, about about 8, I'm sorry, 9.45, but it's certainly a pleasure to join with you again. Uh, Di and I have certainly some similar points to share, and I have to say it was a privilege to travel to Australia and to meet so many planners and understand the similarities, not only between our countries, but also the planning issues. And so I'll get right into uh, the presentation. Uh, the first is that I always like to talk about how planning is perceived. And very often, a lot of people perceive planners, uh, some in a positive way, some in a not so positive way. They view us as being process or systems driven, bureaucratic, or basically people who tell other people what they can and cannot do with their property. And when I challenge people about what the P in APA or PS stands for, should we call ourselves the American Process Association or the Process Institute of Australia, uh, or is it something else? And my hope when I became president is that we put the P back in our organizations that it stands for planning and not just process, not that process is not important. When I travel the country and try to explain why planning is so important, I like to talk about Basically, it is a result of growth and change, uh, people migrating from different parts of the country. And if you look at the evolution of the United States, uh, back in the 19th century, our population was a mere 5 million people, and our urbanized population was 6%. By the 20th century, as a result of migration, primarily immigration from Europe, our population swelled to 76 million. Our country is now, in the 21st century, uh, over 300 million with an urbanized population of over 80 percent and as we look to the 22nd century we're expected to have over half a billion people with an urbanized population of over 90 percent and I like to remind people when we think about the 22nd century it is not that far off a person born today can live to see the 22nd century so as planners we have to reset our time horizons when we start planning uh, for our country, for our states, for our communities, that is not just 10 and 20 years, but actually 50 and even 100 years. In fact, there was a report in the U.S. that at, at one out of three children born today will live to see the 22nd century, so it is not as far off as we think. So as we look at the change, at least in our country and your country, over the next 50 years, the United States is expected to grow by 124 million people, and Australia is expected to grow by 16 million people and the planet by 2.3 billion. In the U.S., we're, we have to figure out where we're going to house uh, or place 50 million new housing units. And in Australia, you're going to have to find room for 6 to 8 million new housing units. And that doesn't include the roads or the facilities support that growth. And my question is, what will the next generation of communities look like? like the 1950s, like the 1980s, or is there something different? And that is something that planners need to be mindful of. I also like to remind people about the role of planning. We have unique responsibility where we're guardians of the future. We think about the uncertainty and protect that uncertainty about how we grow. We protect the public interest, the public health, safety, and welfare. But in the U.S., we have a code of ethics, and planners have a special concern for the long-term consequences of present actions. And this is something that's very difficult when I'm meeting with elected officials because they want to put forward a certain proposal. But as planners, we have an ethical responsibility to share consequences of those actions, even though it may go counter to what an elected official may want to do. But this is not the tragedy that I see. What concerns me more is the consequences of taking no action of elected officials, of citizens, or businesses putting their head in the sand because no action is an action. And as planners, we have to talk about the consequences of taking no action. 
And so when we work with communities, we have a conversation that when you say no to something, you're actually saying yes to something else. And what are you saying yes to? In our community, there's a big pushback to apartments and rentals and multifamily. And we have to share with the public that what you could be saying is seniors or elderly and young people, we don't want you in our community because in our country, uh, there are more and more young people that desire to live in smaller units and rentals and not own a home. And so it could challenge the way we attract uh, those various populations to our community. If we look at the U.S. over the past 150 years, when we focus on planning, each era is defined by key issues. And dating back to the 1840s, at the birth of our profession, throughout history, every 30, 40, or 50 years, the profession evolves and it changes to deal with the circumstances of our time. And if you look at 2010 and beyond, we're at that point again. Because of the, the, the Great Recession, what happened to the worldwide uh, the economy, we're now asking ourselves for the first time, what's next? What are we going to do with the second century of our profession? Because planners always step up to respond to the challenges of our time. And right now, today in the U.S., we're going through this change. So I tell young people in college, this is probably one of the most exciting times you can ever experience in the profession because we're going through one of those changes at this very moment. And if we look at Australia, and I try to do my best to look at your past 150 years, starting with the colonial period, the early 20th century, but between 1980 and I would say the 21st century, you've dealt with the Contemporary Planning Act. And I challenge you, uh, just as I challenge the American planners, What's next? You can feel a change is underway as we move into the 21st century. And we're not alone. Architects, landscape architects, uh, economists, planners, we're all trying to figure out what's next. So first I try to challenge planners that first and foremost we need to understand emerging trends and issues and frame them for the public. We need to understand trends like a stockbroker understands and watches the market so we can anticipate and tell the community and the public what we need to prepare for. I like to share this very often with some of the American planners, but in the U.S. and back in 2009, the U.S. News and World Report named planning as one of the top 50 professions in 2010. Now, I don't know what they said about 2011 or 2012 or 13, but in 2010 they identified us as an important profession because of all these changes we're anticipating. And more and more, I'm finding people, elected officials, are looking for leaders who will tell them and talk to them about the uncertainty about the future. People with vision, solutions, and big ideas, and the courage to speak up and solve the tough challenges of our day. And we're seeing this shift in planning where it's not just spatial, but planning is about place and people. And that's something that planners have to deal with more and more. I know very often people like to split the social planning to the spatial planning, but more and more you see how they're integrated into one, and you'll see that through this presentation. And I also share with planners, if you want to be valuable, you must show your value so that you become the go-to profession that people want to engage. So as I give you my personal list of some of the 21st century challenges and emerging trends, uh, this is just a partial list. Uh, I've shortened it for the purpose of this presentation. I will not cover everything. But the point I want to make about this list is that these, some of these on this list are brand new. They've never happened before to the United States or even to the world. And the other issue about this list is because they're brand new, you can't Google to find the answer to these problems. You will require innovation, creativity to solve these problems. And some of these are game changers for you as well as for us here in the States. The graying of America, or what we call the silver tsunami. This is something that's going to affect every country. In fact, in Japan, it was reported they're now selling more adult diapers than they're selling children's diapers, that this is now a worldwide phenomenon that we have to deal with. So as we look at these challenges and our changing population in the U.S., we're going to be more older, we'll be living longer, we'll be becoming more diverse and multicultural, more people have disabilities and handicaps, more multi-generational households, more singles, 
fewer couples getting married, and by 2050, the majority household in the U.S. will be single. When we look at the changing population in Australia, it's almost identical to the U.S. There are more older Australians, longer life expectancy. I know you deal with the term ancestry, but you're seeing more diversity, multiculturalism, lower fertility rates. As you can look across these issues, it's almost identical to what's happening in the U.S. So my question is, what are the planning implications of these changes? They're not just spatial, they're social, and it's something we have to take an account for as we plan for the future. I also want to remind people as we use this term sustainability, and I personally believe in the next 10 years the term will be coming out of fashion, we'll still pursue the economy, the equity, and the environment, but the term will evolve into something else. I want to point out one element of this chart, and that's equity, and that's people. Most people, when they talk about sustainability, focus on the environment and focus on the economy and don't really address equity. That is the silent E of sustainability. If we do not address equity, we are not being sustainable, and I encourage people not to even use the term. It's all three E's that make up sustainability. It's about the equity, and it's about people, and you'll see why in a second. Let's first start now with aging households and families. This one will be focused just on the U.S., just to give you an example of the challenges that we're facing. In the U.S., by 2030, one in five Americans will be over the age of 65. This has never happened before in American history. And there are a lot of communities that are going to be impacted by this change. Not only will there be more people over the age of 65, but by 2050, the number of Americans over 85 will triple from 5 million to close to 20 million. But the one that's really changing the entire equation is by 2025, the number of single-person households will be the predominant household in America. Not a family, one person will be the predominant household, and that will continue on for at least a generation. And I'll share with you the implications in a second. In our country, we're also looking at counties, which is a unit of government that's a little bit larger uh, than a city. We're now seeing this natural decrease where 25% of all of the counties in the U.S. are fading away. The common thread is older Americans who can no longer have children, and their children are leaving rural areas and saying, I'm not staying here. I don't like the job prospects. I don't like the place. I'm going to a major city. I'm going to Adelaide, or I'm going to Sydney, or I'm going to Melbourne. I'm not staying here. I want another lifestyle. And just to show you the impact of what this looks like, I'll show you two states in the U.S. This one is West Virginia. What you see in beige are all the counties that are losing population, and most of those are rural counties. The only reason why you see that dark blue uh, in the upper right-hand corner of the state is that is part of the commuting area for Washington, D.C. Otherwise, the state would be in a free fall in terms of losing population. The other state I'm going to show you, which is even more shocking, this is the state of Kansas. And this is a state that doesn't even have a metropolitan strategy, yet you can see they're desperately losing population. In our country, 20% of our population lives in rural areas, and we see that population shrinking every year, and they're all moving to cities. So some of the implications of an aging population in our country uh, what are people over the age of 65 going to do when they realize they can no longer drive? And we built a society based on the automobile. Right now, we believe there are about 600,000 people over the age of 70 that stop driving every year. And if you look at Atlanta, which is known for regional sprawl, in just two years, 90% of seniors in that region live in neighborhoods with poor transit options. Now, this is something that didn't happen overnight. I'm sure the planners were saying we have to do something, but each jurisdiction wanted to plan in isolation. They said, let the market build, 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 and now they have a crisis they cannot solve in two years. Now, if you look at the chart, my area, Raleigh-Durham, was number five on the list of mid-sized metros, but the good news is planners caught it early. We had a plan in place, and now the seniors are thanking us for actually thinking about the future identifying this emerging trend 
and now we have a plan in place which I'll show you later. Another phenomenon that we're dealing with is the rise of unwed births. Back in 1960, five out of 100 children were born to unwed mothers. You fast forward to 2009, it's now four out of 10. And it's across all racial groups, not just isolated to, uh, to blacks, it's to Hispanics and whites. And so, in fact, more than half of the mothers in the United States under 30 are unwed. So this is a generation of new type of families without a father that we're going to have to deal with in the 21st century. Now, we're even seeing a drop in people getting married. Now, when I travel around the country and I go to college campuses and I see that young lady talking to that young man, that young man talking to that young lady throughout the presentation, I will tell that young lady, that student, young lady, do not listen to what he's saying. He's not being serious. How do I know? This chart tells me so. If you look at this chart, for whatever reason, uh, that age where people generally get married between 25 and 34 was 80% in the 90s. It's now dropped in half by 2010. And so for whatever reason, whether people don't want to get married, they rather live together without getting married, or they're waiting longer to get married, we're seeing a change in the marriage uh, among our young population. So how does this impact how we plan for people going forward. This is another snapshot just to show you the enormous change from 1960 to 2025 of the households in the U.S. Households with children in 1960 was 48%, and by 2025 is going to drop to 28%. Now, if I'm a developer and I'm looking at this chart I want to build for the market, what type of housing will I build by 2025? Will it be the same as the 1960s? And that's what we're trying to bring uh, the attention here in the States. So what are the implications? Both the elderly and younger generation will demand a urban lifestyle, different housing choices, and different transportation choices. There's now a desire for smaller homes, and more and more both younger people and older people, rather than rent, than own. So that's a big change in the States. Our biggest concern is because this disconnect between the buyer, a single person, and the inventory, a single family home, the experts now estimate there will be 25 million single family homes on the market by 2030 with nobody to buy them. Now I understand in Australia that buying a home is a source of pride and most people aspire to buy a home. That is not the case in the states where most people prefer to be mobile and they prefer to rent rather than own. Very quickly on race and ethnicity, or as you call it, ancestry, uh, we're seeing some dramatic changes in race in our country. By 2043, for the first time in American history, there'll be no majority race above 50 percent. And by 2050, as you look at the chart below, this is what the American population is going to look like. The white population for the first time will drop below 50 percent. The Hispanic is really the fastest growing population, which will double by 2030. And so we're now having this conversation about what is an inclusive community as we see the Hispanic population will triple from 2008 to 2050. By 2023, minorities will comprise of more than half of all children in the U.S. And by 2050, that number is expected to be above 62%. Just to show you uh, visually what this means, uh, this is now a map of showing people of color by county. Uh, the beige color is less than 30%, and as you go to the darkest color, it is 50%. This is courtesy of a group here in New York, in uh, Oakland, in Washington, D.C., Policy Link. I'll show you 1980, and then this will look like by 2040. So politically, if you understand what's happening here in our country, this is causing a lot of concern. When I share this slide, people get worried about what it means. But then I let them know, guess what? It's already happened in Raleigh, and you didn't even know it. There's no rides in the street. It's a well-run city. It's considered one of the best cities in the U.S. And so when people imagine what this change means, they get frightened. But to let them know it's already happened and didn't even know it is something as planners we're trying to manage this change because this change is coming. Planning is not just about place. It's about people. And we want to manage all these demographic changes. So neighborhoods will become more diverse. School diversity policies will be a debate we'll have to watch. And we believe the 2020 census will be a wake-up call 
because you'll start to see the numbers change dramatically. And even where I live in Wake County, which is the county where I work, uh, you can see the headline of the newspaper. Uh, I would have used another headline, but uh, it got the point and still is considered one of the best school districts and best cities uh, in the United States. I'm now going to shift gear and gears and talk about generations. I don't know if, you, if Australians actually slice up your generations the way we do, but here in the U.S., we basically have about six living generations, and we're about to have a seventh generation. Everybody's trying to get famous, trying to figure out what the name of the next generation after Z is going to be. But basically, these are the generations in our country, and I'll summarize them very quickly. I'll come back to this in a second. The reason why we focus on these generations, because all of them are specific markets. They have different values, different needs, and different aspirations. And it drives their preferences for neighborhoods, for homes, and for lifestyles. And so we don't just plan for one group. We look very specifically at the market segments. So as we look back at the greatest generation, uh, most of these individuals lived through World War II. Uh, they, um, they lived through what was called the Great Depression, and they truly understood the real sense of sacrifice. In fact, Thomas Friedman defined this generation this way. They gave their today for our tomorrow, and we've never seen a generation like that since. Most of them right now are in their late 80s and their 90s, and they truly are a special generation. The silent chosen generation grew up during the suburbanization of our country, the highway, the single family home, the baby boomers, uh, which right now there are about 76 million in the United States. They basically changed American culture, and they're just entering their retirement years. We have Gen Xers, which we call the baby bus generation, Gen Y, the millennials, and then we have the Gen Z. The thing about the boom generation is that while my father's generation gave their today for our tomorrow, the boomers gave the young people's tomorrow for their today. And that's something we're trying to rectify uh, here uh, in the United States. So I took the liberty of taking a profile of some of the major cities in Australia and compared it to the U.S. The reason why I shared this chart, I wanted to understand how many X, Y, and Z generations you have in your city. That's generally 45 and below. And you can see the splits at the bottom. In Adelaide, it's roughly 58%. Mel uh, Melbourne, it's 63%. Sydney, about the same. And then in general, uh, Australia is about 60%. This is a point that I like to make when I use this slide. If, if you take the case of uh, in Adelaide, if 58% of the population is 45 and under, that means roughly 40% are those who are elected officials, they're in leadership and making the most of the decisions. Can that older generation give their today for the next generations tomorrow? And as I travel, usually the answer is no. We're in power, we're in leadership, and we're going to make decisions based upon what we know versus for the next generation. But we have to communicate this century belongs to X, Y, and Z. And we have to help them fulfill that purpose. In fact, across the world, we're seeing the Gen Y, a millennial generation, is probably the most purpose-filled generation we've seen uh, really since the 1960s, including some of X as well. So we need to let them own this century because all those emerging issues I shared with you will happen under their watch. And so what we see in the U.S., there are 80 million millennials or Gen Y in our country that this will be the generation to watch. They'll have a big impact in our society. And the tension in our country is not about left or right politics, but it's about a change of values about how we're going to plan and live in the 21st century and beyond. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about what we're doing in Raleigh, North Carolina. We recently developed a comprehensive plan. Our plans really focus on vision and values, and then we create a development code which is a legal document that helps protect the public health, safety, and welfare, but also codifies the plan. So our plan was adopted in 2009. Uh, this is a growth framework map that we came up with. Basically, we wanted a plan to control sprawl, that we will channel 60 to 70% of all growth 
into eight growth centers and 12 corridors. It turned out those growth centers is where we're now focusing housing for the young and for the elderly that now are connected to transportation so they can age in place and they don't have to own an automobile if they don't want to. So that's the plan that is going forward. We also developed a development code. And as you can see, although it removed a lot of regulatory barriers, we wanted to specifically focus on addressing the market trends because planning is not just about spatial planning, but it's about the people we're planning for. And so this was adopted back in February. It goes into effect on September 1st. And so I won't get into the details about the code, but it is considered a form-based or context-based code, which is a lot more streamlined, easier for developers to follow. And we definitely wanted to focus on elements of aging in place because we want to make sure we can take care of our aging population with universal design and other uh, features that would really welcome and help them age in our community. Other emerging issues that we're also watching is that in the U.S., while our population has grown 52 percent in 30 years, our water consumption has tripled on a per person basis. You're now looking at the reservoir of our region. When we were down to 60 days of water. It was a big wake-up call, and it helped the public understand that planning isn't just about planning for land, but it's also planning for our water supply. But if we look into the future in the U.S., the areas that have the highest drought outlook happen to be the places that are experiencing the most growth, which is the South and the West. So while people realize it or not, planners need to recognize that planning for water, water quality, and water availability is tied to our ability to grow. And in fact, most planners don't even pay attention to the availability of water. And it's something that uh, we have been encouraging them to pay more attention to. The same thing with hazard mitigation and climate change. Unfortunately, in our country, there's a big debate whether climate change is real. We all know it's real. And it's something that planners have to have more courage in this country to plan for more resilience and to adapt to the changing environment. So these are also issues that we're dealing with but very often we're not getting a lot of support from our elected officials. So as Di said, it's important that planners communicate the value of planning by communicating the outcomes of planning, not just the process or plans. And that's something we've been working very hard to do. In June of last year, about a year ago, the American Planning Association released a survey and found out, which surprised us, that two-thirds of Americans believe their communities need more planning. And it was across political, racial, and geographic diversity. Everyone believed that they needed more planning and that they supported planning. But when we asked them what were their top five priorities, you can see here on the list, job creation, neighborhood safety, schools, protecting our neighborhoods, and water quality. What was at the bottom of the list was smart growth, land use, transportation, greenways, all the things that planners care about was at the bottom of the list. So for us, it was a wake-up call that we can still pursue those things, but we had to pay a lot more attention to the economy and to job creation, and that's now what's happening in the U.S. So there's this new focus on what we're calling the economy of place, economic development, and what I like to call ROI. I love this phrase by the mayor of Chattanooga. If you are in a city where people want to live, you are in a city where people want to invest. So we're having this big conversation about what is the difference between plan making and deal making. And far too often, we get into this debate that it's a good deal, but it may not be good for the plan. We want to make sure if it's a deal, let it work with the plan rather than compete with the plan. We also see land uh, either as a commodity or as a co building a community. Developers very often see land as a commodity, but we're trying to build a community that will last a generation, not a commodity that has a 20-year lifespan that you want to turn over for the next highest and best use. So it takes this marriage between the two to really embrace good economic development and planning. And finally, planning means jobs and the economy. So one way of explaining our new approach is we started looking at how planning could be smarter and more strategic and add value. I know your tax system is different in Australia, but please bear with me for a second. 
we looked at a 600 single family home subdivision on 150 acres and compared it to the tax value of one acre downtown. And it turns out they were equal. You can either yield the same tax value on 150 acres or on one acre. In fact, that high rise that you see in this slide has 90 times the tax value on a per acre basis. So we told our residents, if you do not support more compact development, what you're really saying as a homeowner, please raise my taxes. So we looked at the analysis of a downtown product and a suburban product. The downtown product could pay off its infrastructure in three years with an ROI of 35%. The suburban product would take 42 years to pay off its infrastructure with a return on investment of 2%. And unfortunately, many places across the U.S., while would should choose the top, actually choose the bottom option, and they strap themselves with years and decades of debt on paying an infrastructure, both to build it and then to maintain it. <clears throat> so we wanted to compare apples to apples on a per acre basis. Walmart or our big box, we want to compare Walmart to not a high rise, but a six story downtown building. The Walmart sits on 34 acres. I don't know the translation in hectares, but 34 acres. Downtown sits on a half acre. Real estate taxes from the Walmart, 6,500. The downtown building, 10 times the amount. What about jobs per acre? The big box produced six jobs per acre. The downtown mixed use building, 74. This is the type of information we do not share with decision makers, but now there are more and more reports that are being generated to show how planning could be more smart and better because as planners we want to add value. So we wanted to take a look at Raleigh to see our land value on a per acre basis. The darker the color showed the higher value, but I could not see downtown. So I asked my staff, please put it in three dimensions, and can anybody tell me where downtown is located? You can see the amount of tax value that downtown is carrying for the entire city. And that is now why we're trying to say we have to be smart about how we use land, that this creates uh, revenue for the city, and it also creates jobs. And so now our department is really viewed as an asset and not as a liability. We're also focusing on creative placemaking because planning also creates experiences, memories that people want to experience as they come and visit, work, and play. And so we're making a conscious effort of leveraging that public investment to create great places throughout our city. And here's just six examples that we've implemented in the past 10 years. One great example is our downtown. We were a city of about, at the time, 300,000. We decided to invest 25 million to reopen our main street, which was a mall. And as a result, we've now had three billion of private development in the last six years. And when they thought nobody would come opening day, over 100,000 people came to the opening of our street. And now the development continues. And as we compare ourselves, to local governments in North Carolina, because we took a smarter approach to how we're going to develop, we're one of the lowest tax municipalities in North Carolina. So in the U.S., we're asking that question, what's next? Uh, as president, uh, I chaired a commission to start talking about the emerging issues. That report will be coming out later this year, so I encourage you to take a, get a copy of it. And my entire presidency was really focused on how planners need to lead, inspire, and innovate, and you see our five goals uh, that were developed uh, as I was president and will continue on for at least another couple of months. And so just like Di said, uh, I've encouraged plans wherever I go. Because of these emerging issues, you need to fall back in love with planning again because of the emerging issues that are out there. You need to fall in love just like you did the very first time you went to planning school and you were passionate about this profession we need you to rekindle that passion once again. So in closing, I want to challenge you. Who is going to address these emerging issues? Can we give our today for the next generations tomorrow? That's a conversation we need to have. What does the next generation of Australian planners expect from you? Remember that there are consequences for present actions, but more importantly, there are consequences for just saying, no, I don't want to do anything about it. Planning is about place, but it's also about people. And I close by saying your community needs you, your
your country needs you, and your planet needs you. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks, Mitch. Um, that was great, and I think it was just as inspiring as it was uh, when we heard you in, uh, in Canberra. So thank you for joining us um, today. Now, we've got um, about 15 minutes for um, some questions, and I think everyone was so uh, involved in uh, listening to both yourself and Di that uh, they weren't uh, writing their questions, but I'm sure they'll start shooting them through now. But we do have a couple of questions that Di has to so I'll actually hand over to Di to ask. Uh, her questions and get a bit of discussion started. And in the meantime, for those uh, in the audience, if you can uh, start typing through your uh, questions and comments, um, I'll uh, relay them to our speakers. So I'll hand over to you, Di. Uh, Mitch, I, I did have um, some earlier questions that I had sent through, but I'm, I'd like to just explore for a second those amazing figures that you share in your own community on the different uh, that it uh, that it takes for a, a big box shopping centre in generating jobs compared to the impact of a downtown mixed use. At times when we're all battling to fund infrastructure, create jobs and to keep our local governments uh, sustainable, how did you manage to explain to the community and to your elected leaders the importance of, of that material? Well. The way it worked primarily for us is that we have what's called capital budgeting. And so in any given year, uh, the, the elected officials have a choice of where to invest. Let's take $10 million. And we invested in one road project. It will yield more development and a higher return through the tax base that will help pay uh, the general fund back. So if we take a project that generates you know, 20 units to the acre, it increases land value, and you're able to pay back that debt sooner. If you do it to an area that is very low density, it takes more years. And so they're now using that to make decisions that, you know something, we're not ready to subsidize and lay out all these dollars for a low density project. Let's put more money where we get a better bang for our buck, where we get a better return on investment. So they're beginning to see it live. And so for them, it's not that they don't provide any infrastructure dollars for the lower density projects. It's just now they will give a bigger preference to the one that yields a better return. So it helped them make better decisions. And as a result, we're now seeing um, a change in our tax base as a result. So it's really about explaining the economic impact of those decisions and giving people Correct. real life figures because that must be stunning for the community as well. Correct, because before that we didn't have that metric to use and they said, look, I want to get to my office quicker, widen the road, but now we're telling them there's a cost and if I invest $10 million here, it will take 30 years to get this return, but if I put the dollars here uh, where infrastructure is already in place, I can get that return on investment back in five years. So it be, it's becoming a better metric in order to make decisions. Wonderful. There's a, report that, yeah, there's a report that just came out by Smart Growth America. It's called Building Better Budgets. It was just released last week. It's called from Smart Growth America. If you Google it, you can download it. Raleigh and other cities, uh, this is now growing in popularity in the U.S. Uh, I know you have a different tax structure, but please take a look at it. Um, Mitch, it's Kirsty here. We've got a question coming through from um, Shane McCormack in the audience um, for you around uh, what you think the next big issues are for um, our rural and regional communities in Australia based on um, what you've seen happening in the US. So, um, so less so on cities and more on the rural and regional communities. Any thoughts on that? In Australia? Well, let me give you, and I have to be very careful of my predictions here, but certainly we have 20% or 62 million Americans live in rural areas. So while we're going to see that population decline, uh, it's still going to be a lot of people living in rural areas. I suspect over time that they're going to have to, the rural economy is going to have to tie itself better to metropolitan economy because right now most of our renewables, most of our agriculture, and most of what we call our ag tourism comes from rural areas. 
And in some parts of our state, because it's owned by the federal government, because it's parkland, it just happens to be vast quantities of open space. Uh, we suspect over time that population will continue to shrink. Uh, and we suspect there will be more of corporate farmers buying smaller farms in order to produce our agriculture. Uh, but we don't see any reversal in the near future of changing the trends of what we see in rural areas. Uh, but the key, I believe, is to tie the rural economy to the metropolitan economy in order for those areas to have a stronger link going forward. I suspect the same is going to happen in Australia where more and more young people will be leaving rural areas, moving to metropolitan areas, and you'll see the rural areas becoming older and older over time. Thanks, Mitch. Um, Guy, you're in a regional area, um, although you've got quite a large urban settlement, obviously, with the but your area encompasses um, a fairly significant um, you know, regional area of Queensland. Any reflections on that question from you? I think watching in particular the graphics that Mitch was displaying about that those people choosing to shift from rural towns and moving to larger towns is really interesting because we, we see the challenge of that in um, rural and regional Australia. Um, so while I, I live in Australia's second largest inland town, we do represent a number of smaller towns as well. I think that's the challenge because until we can provide sustainable opportunities for people to live in those towns, uh, maybe improving um, uh, internet access and facilities such as the rollout of NBN across Australia will help because I, I do think that's going to be a challenge for us. Yeah, I don't know. In, in our country, the millennials or Gen Y are changing the way people are planning because they just don't have an appeal for rural areas. I think the vast majority prefer to live in metropolitan areas. People say, well, don't worry. When they, have met, when they get married and have children, they'll move to the suburbs. But as you can see from the chart, only half of getting married, and when they do get married, the women are saying, that's okay, I'll raise a child on my own. In fact, there was just a Pew report showing how single mothers are now becoming the breadwinners of their families. So we're seeing these very interesting dynamics happening, and most single mothers prefer to live in closer, more populated areas than in rural areas. So these are the trends that we're watching to find out um, that young people are attracted to place. Uh, they want a sense of place, and it's very hard in some cases to get that in, in rural areas and the services that go along uh, with metropolitan areas as well. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, Guy, you had a question for Mitch? I had a number. I well, could have asked a... questions of Mitch for hours. <laughs> Sorry, Mitch, Sorry, what were you about to say? Uh, you have one about the 25 million excess single-family homes by 2030 with no market? Yeah, look, that's fascinating, isn't it? Because to have, I've been watching um, multimedia feeds about that, that's either going to create an enormous opportunity for reuse, or if we're talking demolition, then that's got such significant impacts on the sustainability issues in America. What, what we're seeing is a couple of phenomenons. We're calling them, I don't know if you know of the show, The Golden Girls, but it was a group of elderly women who lived together, so they're calling it the Golden Girl Suburbs, where uh, elderly women or men will decide to live in a home by themselves. We're also looking at immigrant populations uh, to start doubling and tripling up in some of these homes. So uh, we do believe the housing stock will be absorbed. Uh, our concern was that the era of the McMansion or the large homes is one that is in somewhat danger. Uh, if people want to build in suburban areas, uh, we're now seeing a desire to build smaller homes, about a third of the size that are being built today. Those will be more resilient and probably will be purchased a lot quicker than the larger, larger homes that we're seeing with five bedrooms and four bathrooms because with the rise of single-person households and singles, will a single person want a house with five bedrooms? And so that's, we do believe it will be absorbed. It will be uh, seniors who want to double and triple up and immigrant populations or other couples that want to just double and triple up to live in a larger home. Has the economic issue 
impacted on that changing household size, uh, sorry, changing size of the house as well. Uh, for me, I live in a very small home, but I like that because it allows me to invest money instead of in a mortgage into travelling and, and into seeing things around the world. Has the changing economic times perhaps also encouraged people to review household housing size? Well, I think energy efficiency has been the biggest driver. Uh, all the surveys that we're seeing uh, that homeowners or prospective homeowners said number one on their list is energy efficiency. And then they all said they wanted to have a smaller home. So I think all the extras, the bonus rooms, the TV room, the theater room, the, all the things that are going on, I do know that's a preference for many Australians. But that is a trend that is dying in the U.S. It is not as big as an appeal as it used to be in the 80s and 90s and maybe about five or six years ago. So people just want uh, just a one space where they can have a living space and then bedrooms, but is a desire for just a simpler lifestyle. Uh, but energy efficiency is number one on the list. Fascinating. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks, Mitch. Um, Doug, we have a, a question that's coming to you from Philip Pollard, um, and he reflects that um, your presentation, you know, obviously and understandably focused on the events, um, the recent sort of extreme natural disaster events that have been going on in Australia. Um, and he asks, uh, how do you think we can make the connection to the community between uh, the more severe and more frequent events and climate change? So drawing drawing the links between the, uh, those events that we're seeing and um, showing them how that links to climate change. Certainly for me, when I'm out in community meetings having that precise conversation, what I try to do is walk people through that obvious changing of severity of events and the recurrence of events and focus on that particular impact. Uh, at times, as we all know, having the conversation about climate change can be emotive. But when, when you start to walk people through the obvious changes that are happening both in, in Australia and around the world and the extremes of events, to see many tornadoes occurring in, in Australia is really unusual. Now, Mitch, they're very small compared to obviously the devastation we've been seeing in America recently. I find the best way to explain any of this to the community is, is to talk through real life examples. Uh, rather than a, a more esoteric conversation. That way they, they relate and they understand. And we'll, uh, we have one more question here, which was actually a question from you, Di, to Mitch, around how do we get the community to understand the consequences of saying no, um, hmm. that saying no to one thing means saying yes to something else. Any um, thoughts on that one, Mitch? Yes. Um, in all of our planning exercises, we avoid having just visioning. And what we do is we do a very in-depth trends analysis, and then we have a conversation with the public. We don't just say, how do you envision the future, but here are the emerging trends. What do you want to do about it? When the public, that's one approach that we take. The other one is when we're in a meeting and people just say, no, no, no. Uh, one is that we look at who's in the audience. And I didn't put this in my presentation, but now we realize that uh, most of the room was dominated by the older generation. And they were saying, no, the older people get, the more not in my backyard they become, and they say no. So we purposely started using different techniques to do outreach, social media. And as we brought in the younger generation, we started hearing yes, yes, yes. So part of it is that we actually tell the public, when you say no, here are the consequences, and very often, as I work with planners, we don't do that. We just say no, and we accept it, and we walk away. But if we truly are concerned about the future, even for those who aren't born yet, we have a professional obligation to have that conversation. And very often, I don't think about it. There was one meeting where this woman was saying no to rentals, and here was a young lady that just graduated from college. I pulled her over to the table. I said, I want the two of you to have a conversation. Because her image of a renter was some down and out you know, bum on the street, and here was this attractive college student just graduated looking to rent a unit. So it, it takes a little bit extra work, but you have to explain to people what is the consequence of saying no, because they don't often think about it. They believe we have the numbers, we say no, therefore you should listen.
Excellent. Okay. Um, I'll just, um, uh, Gillian, can you pop Di and Mitch on mute so we're not echoing so much? Um, and we'll just uh, wrap up there today. So I'd just like to, uh, to thank Di and Mitch for making the time to present uh, to us today. I think it was a great, a great session and good to, to hear um, that discussion. Thank you for the, um, to the audience for the questions that came through uh, from you. Um, this, as I said at the beginning, is the first of a series of uh, sessions we're going to have. And so the next uh, webinar that we've got coming up on the horizon uh, is on the 21st of June. And that features uh, Stephen Moore uh, presenting The Next Urbanism, New Tools for Creating Great Places. And Tamara Lowen uh, with Dreamings to Visions, Yorta Yorta Vision Nation, uh, Yorta Yorta Nation Visions, Aims and Opportunities. And that session is around planning practice. Um, the information for that is available on the PEER website. Um, so uh, thank you very much everyone for participating today. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, your participation in future webinars. Uh, if you have any uh, questions about accessing the presentations, uh, if you can contact uh, webdesign at planning.org.au and uh, we can assist you. So thank you very much everyone um, and have a, a lovely uh, day or evening. Thank you again. <laughs>